All right, we've been talking about corrosion. Here's the question for you. If we simply remove a metal from its aqueous environment, can you stop corrosion? In the galvanic, uh, in the galvanic cell pictures that we showed you previously, there was always a metal in a solution, a metal in a solution, a salt bridge, and the wire connecting them. So what if we did get rid of the solutions? Will that fix our problem, right? Maybe you've seen this in piers. They certainly seem to be mostly corroded below the waterline and not above. Um, so will that stop all corrosion? Definitely not. <laughs> Oxidation can still happen. It doesn't have to have water present. Um, materials can oxidize. In fact, let's talk about this. So here you've got a silver spoon forming a silver oxide tarnish. And this will happen regardless of whether it's in water or not. So if this is an oxidation reaction, then there must be a reduction reaction. You can't have just one. Redox reactions always have to have reduction and oxidation. Something to give up electrons and something that's going to accept them. It has to be both. So what are the oxidation and reduction reactions here? Well, let's write it for a generic one. We've got a metal that's being oxidized, meaning it's turning into a metal that is now 2 plus or n plus, n number of electrons. We could just write this generically, I guess. n number of electrons plus, so it's lost electrons, plus n number of electrons, okay? And at the same time, you've got to have oxygen as the recipient of that. So let's say you've got a gas molecule of oxygen. Um, it's going to accept electrons. In this case, it's going to accept two electrons to form um, an O2 minus ion, okay? So that's an example of an oxidation reaction. You don't have to have water for this to happen. If the metal's in contact with air, this reaction can take place. So what does it look like? If the metal's in contact with air, let's say you've got a block of metal here, right? So you've got oxygen out here, air, which contains 21% oxygen, okay? So what will happen is it's going to form an oxide where these things touch one another at the interface between the metal and the oxygen if that is thermodynamically favorable. If thermodynamics says it's happened, then it will form. So let's say that an oxide forms Right? So that is our oxide, we'll call it MO, right, for metal oxide. So um, in order for this to form an oxide and to keep on forming that oxide, for that oxide to grow, what has to happen? Well, you just formed an oxide that covered up the metal, but we said that you can only grow oxide when oxygen can touch the metal. So you have to have a couple things happen. Either your metal has to be able to travel through here to the surface, right? Metal has to diffuse maybe in the ionic state. Metal has to diffuse that way. Or you have to have oxygen diffuse inward, O2 minus, right? If either of those two things can happen, then your oxide can keep on growing, okay? Now, there's another thing that can happen. We've been assuming that this is completely fully dense, the oxide. But what if it's not fully dense? We actually see that as a pretty common scenario. Um, by the way, uh, oxides form on things all around us, even when you don't think there's an oxide there. For example, aluminum. Um, for example, considering this climbing gear, you've got an aluminum carabiner, right? And you've got a stainless steel carabiner. Neither of these look like oxides, which are ceramics. These look like metals. And yet oxides have grown on these. What you have is stainless steel and you have aluminum. Both of these form what are called passivating oxide layers. Here's what I'm talking about. Here's an actual microscope image. This is amazing. We live in the future. You're looking at rows of atoms here. These little white spots in this image right here. See these rows of atoms running that way? You're literally seeing rows of atoms. We'll talk a lot more about this in a few chapters when we get to crystal structures on chapter three. But you're literally seeing rows of atoms, and then you've got this block here in the middle, which is your aluminum oxide layer. It forms a very thin oxide layer. Look how thick that is. That's about three nanometers. How big is a nanometer? Remember that one nanometer is equal to one times 10 to the negative ninth meters. So you're looking at something one billionth the thickness of a meter. So crazy small. That tiny little thin layer of aluminum oxide it's here. It's on this thing. And that's what prevents this from further corrosion. It forms what's called a passivating layer. Why do we call it passivating? Because oxygen can't travel through it and aluminum can't travel through it. And so even though it's thermodynamically favorable to form aluminum oxide, it's very favorable to form it. 
you can't form it if you don't have the reactants and the products in contact with another. And so all you had to do was put a passivating layer on it. And aluminum forms a really good passivating layer. Okay. So how do you know whether your material will be like aluminum or stainless steel and form a passivating layer or whether it's going to form a non-passivating layer and form rust like in this old clamp I have here. You can see all the rust that's on that and the patina. That's because it didn't form a passivating layer. It formed an oxide layer that just allowed it to keep on growing the oxide layer. Well, there's a really great tool that we can use. It's a type of calculation called a pilling bedworth ratio, named after the people that discovered this. So the pilling bedworth ratio is as follows. It says you take the volume of the oxide that forms and you divide that by the volume of the metal. Okay. Now, what is the volume? The volume is simply the molecular mass divided by the density. And so if you take that, you can rearrange this expression to be the mass of the oxide times the density of the metal divided by the number of electrons that are in the metal oxide multiplied by the mass of the metal times the density of the oxide. What this is essentially doing, it's saying we started out with um, a block of metal. Okay, So let's assume that part of this is going to get converted into a metal oxide. So this is now metal oxide. If there's no change in volume when this process occurs, then what you're probably going to end up with is a very dense passivating layer. Okay, But if there's a big change in density, let's say when you convert it that now the oxide layer wants to be a lot larger, then it's unlikely to form a nice passivating layer. Instead, it's likely to form a layer that chips off. See this here in this image? It's too big and so it has to chip up. And when it chips up, you've exposed a new pathway to the metal below that the oxygen can get to. Or the other scenario is, let's say it doesn't form a too large layer. Let's say it wants to be smaller, so it would like to fill just some smaller area, like this. Well, if it wants to fill some smaller area than that, but it's constrained to the footprint where it started, what it's going to do is be this scenario over here, where now there's going to be gaps. There's going to be like Swiss cheese. There's going to be holes in the structure that allow the oxygen to get down to the metal in that scenario too. So you can calculate this for lots of different metals, and we find the general rule of thumb that if the pilling, pilling bedworth ratio is much smaller than one, like the case of potassium and potassium oxide, then... If it's smaller, then you're going to open up channels. You're going to end up with a porous Swiss cheese structure that keeps on uh, corroding. If it's roughly equal to one or maybe two, it's probably going to be a pretty good barrier. It's probably going to block the uh, further oxidation. But if it's much larger than, say, two or maybe three, then you're going to get this scenario where they are spalling because they're trying to grow too large. So this is a really uh, cool ratio that you can use for lots of different metals to figure out what type of oxide is going to form. Is it going to be one that protects the metal or one that causes it to degrade? Okay? And there's some examples I've listed here. Now, uh, the book goes on to talk about the weight gain. Literally, if you took a uh, little sample, like let's say we've got a scale here, right? So you've got a scale that can measure weight gain, and you put a little piece of metal on it. You could just leave it there, and as the oxide layer, layer grows on this thing, you should see a weight gain on that scale. If you plot that weight gain, you can see that there's a lot of different scenarios uh, that, to consider. For one thing, so here's time. And then you've got weight gain over here. If the weight gain is linear, if it just is proportional to time, then you know that you have an oxide where spallation is occurring, meaning as it grows, it's chipping off that layer, which opens up a new surface, and it's just going to keep on being linear growth. But it might be like this, where it, it grows and then it actually slows down over time. So this first one indicates spallation. But the second one indicates passivation. There's something that's slowing it down, so it's passivating it, right? And then they even show a logarithmic, which is just slightly less than this. And that's typically for thin film, low temperature oxides like aluminum oxides. Even more, it's even better form of passivation, okay? So that is how you can get oxidation occurring without any water present with metal simply reacting with air to form scales or oxides.